Chapter 1 How It All Began Roberta, Peter, and Phyllis were not railway children at first. They were ordinary children. They lived with their mother and father in a large house in the city. Their mother stayed at home and looked after them. She read them stories and played games with them. Their father worked in a government office and came home only on weekends. Roberta was the eldest, and then came Peter, and then Phyllis. When this story began, they were a happy family. They had nothing to worry about. Their father was able to pay for a cook and a maid, so their mother did not have to do a lot of housework. On Peter's tenth birthday, he received a model railway engine for a present. It made real steam, and the steam made it move. But there was something wrong with it. It blew up and wouldn't work anymore. When the children's father came home that weekend, he looked at the engine. I can mend it, he said, but I haven't time now. I'll mend it another day. As the family sat happily around the table eating their meal, there was a knock at the door. The maid went to answer it. She soon came back and said to the children's father, There are two men to see you, sir. I have asked them into the front room. The children's father thanked the maid and went to see the two men. He was gone a long time. The children heard their father's voice. He seemed to be shouting. When he came back into the dining room, he said, I must go away. I have a problem with the government. He left the house with the two men. The children asked their mother what was happening. Don't worry, she said. Everything will be all right. Every day for the next week, the children's mother left the house early in the morning and did not return until late in the evening. She looked ill and worried all the time. There is something wrong, the children said. They asked the cook and the maid if they knew what it was. But they would not say anything to the children. Then, about a week after their father went away, their mother said, I'm sorry, children, but we must leave this house. We are going to live in a smaller house in the country. At first, the children were excited. They thought this was a good idea. However, when they got to the house in the country, they were not happy. It was small and dirty, and Roberta thought she saw rats. The children's mother told them that they weren't rats, they were just big mice. They did not really believe her, but they pretended that they did. Only some of their furniture from their old house was in the cottage, everything else was in boxes. I'm hungry, Peter said soon after they arrived. Can we have some supper? I'm afraid the lady I paid to clean here and buy some food hasn't done her work very well, the children's mother said. The cottage is still very dirty, and there isn't any fresh food. What are we going to do? Roberta asked. There's some canned food in a box in the cellar, her mother replied. Let's go and see what there is. They went down the stairs to the cellar. It was very dark under the house. There are some candles somewhere, the children's mother said. Let's all look for them. They soon found the candles. Then they looked around for something to open the box with. Peter found a spade. He pushed it under the lid of the box and pulled up to slowly open it. Inside, there were tins of sardines and a box of biscuits. It isn't much of a meal, the children's mother said. But it will be enough until the morning. Then we can go to the shop in the village and buy what we need. The children were dirty and dusty. There wasn't any water in the cottage, so they went into the yard where there was a pump. They had great fun washing under the pump. After the meal, they all felt tired. It's been a long and exciting day, their mother said. So let's go to bed early. She found some sheets and blankets in another box, so they all went to bed, except for their mother. She stayed up very late, unpacking the many boxes and putting things away in the drawers and cupboards. The next morning, the children woke up early. 
Let's get up and explore, Roberta said. We haven't looked at the garden yet. The children washed quickly under the pump, got dressed, and ran out of the cottage into the garden. The house was on top of a hill, and the garden led down to a railway line at the bottom. There was a tunnel too, but the children could not hear a train. The weather was already warm, and the children lay down in the sun and thought about their new life. The cottage was small but comfortable. We'll soon get used to it, Roberta said. Phyllis said, "We haven't any servants here. We'll have to help Mother with the cooking and housework." I can't cook, Peter said. Don't worry, Roberta laughed. We'll soon find something for you to do. The children soon fell asleep in the warm sun. Their mother came outside and woke them up. I've got a surprise for you, she said. There's another room. I thought it was a kitchen cupboard, but it's a small room. Come and see. She led the way to a door in the cottage that opened from the kitchen into a small room. There was a table in the room. On the table there was roast beef, cheese, and apple pie. The lady who cleaned the cottage, Mrs. Viney, did leave us food. She said. She just forgot to tell us where it was. The children sat up at the table and ate the biggest breakfast they had ever had. Mother said, "What are you going to do after breakfast?" "Can we go and look at the railway?" Peter said. "Perhaps a train will come." "I'm sure it will if you wait long enough," Mother said. "Off you go, but don't stay out too long." Chapter Two, Coal Mines. The railway was at the bottom of the garden. It was separated from the garden by a fence. The rails and telephone lines stretched away into the distance. Suddenly, they heard a loud noise. Seconds later, a train rushed past. Smoke poured out of its funnel. The children saw a man on the footplate putting coal onto the fire. It's like a Big dragon, Roberta said. I felt the heat. It's better than a toy train, Peter said. Do you think that train is going to London? Phyllis asked. That's where Daddy is, isn't he? The children thought their father was in London, but they weren't sure. Let's walk along the side of the railway line to the station, Peter said. We can ask where the train is going there. When they reached the station, they saw that there were many different railway lines. Some of them had trucks on them, just waiting for an engine to collect them. There were piles of coal between the rails. The piles had white lines on them. A porter came out of his room, and Peter asked him politely, "What are the white lines for on the piles of coal?" "They are so we know how much coal should be there," the porter said. "So don't you steal any." The children thought the porter was joking because he seemed to be a friendly man. The children did not stay at the station very long on this first visit. Instead, they went back home. Although they missed their father, they were getting used to not having him at home. They were also getting used to not seeing much of their mother. She would be alone in her room all day and write many different stories. She read the stories at tea time, and they loved them. One evening, Roberta said, "Can we light a fire, Mother?" "No, dear," Mother replied. "It's summer, and coal is expensive. We can't afford to have fires in summer, even though the evenings are cold." At tea time that same day, Phyllis wanted to put butter and jam on her bread, but Mother wouldn't let her. "You can have jam or butter," she said. "You can't have both. We can't afford it." After tea. The children went to the attic where they were allowed to play. I'm going to play a new game, Peter said. But you mustn't tell mother. What kind of game? Phyllis wanted to know. Coal mines, Peter said. His sisters did not understand. You wait, Peter said. 
You'll soon know all about it, but not a word to mother. Two days later, in the evening when it was dark, Peter said, I want you to follow me. There was an old pram in the garden, and Peter pushed it along the side of the railway line to the station. This is Peter's mine, he said. Now, let's fill the pram with coal. The children filled the pram with coal and pushed it home. They emptied the coal into the place where mother kept her coal. They did this twice and were doing it the third time when the station master jumped out from behind a truck. Caught you! he shouted. You young thief! I'm not a thief! Peter said. I'm a coal miner. You're a thief, and I'm taking you to the police, the station master said. Oh, oh no, not, not to, to the, the police. police, two different voices cried, and Roberta and Phyllis came out of the darkness. So, there are three of you, the station master exclaimed. A gang of thieves. Please. Don't take us to the police, Roberta said. We didn't mean any harm. You're the children from the cottage up the line, aren't you? The station master said. Yes, and we didn't mean to steal. It's just that we are very cold, and mother can't afford to buy any coal. Does your mother know what you're doing here? The station master demanded. Oh, no, Roberta said. She'll be very angry if she finds out. Please, don't take us to the police. The station master was thoughtful. Then he said, Very well. This time I'll let you go. But stealing is wrong. And if I catch you stealing coal again, I shall take you all to the police. Now, go home. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. The children said, and they ran off home. Chapter 3 The Green Dragon The children stayed away from the railway station after the adventure with the coal. They did not, however, stay away from the railway. They watched all the trains go by and gave them names. They knew the time of each train. They even gave names to the trains that rushed by during the night. They called one of the trains the Green Dragon. It went to London. An old gentleman often traveled on this train. One day they waved to the train as it passed by. The old gentleman waved back. The children wondered if the old gentleman knew their father. He was in London too, they thought. The children's mother was still writing every day. Sometimes she was happy when an editor bought one of her stories. Sometimes she was sad when the stories came back to her. When she sold the story, she gave the children money to buy buns for tea. One day, Peter walked into the village to buy some buns. He met the station master. The station master spoke to him. He was very friendly. Peter was surprised. Do you know who I am? He asked. You're the boy who stole the coal, the station master said. Aren't you still angry with me? Peter asked. No, the past is the past. Where are you going now? I'm going to buy buns for our tea, Peter said. I thought you were a poor family, the station master said. We are, but when mother sells a story, we have buns for tea, Peter explained. Are you proud to have such a clever mother? The station master asked. Oh, yes. Peter replied. The station master said, Come and visit the station any time. And he continued on his way. Peter bought the buns and went home. The next day, Peter said to his sisters, Let's go to the station and talk to the porter. What about the station master? Roberta said. He invited us, Peter said. He's not angry now. The children went to the station. The porter wasn't busy, and he was pleased to answer all their questions about the trains and the railway. 
the station master came out of his room and promised to take them to the signal box one day. All the railway engines had numbers, and Peter started to collect them. He wrote the numbers down in a little notebook. Peter's mother said, It's all right for you to collect engine numbers, but don't walk on the railway lines. It can be dangerous. Make sure you know which way the trains are coming, and be careful near tunnels and corners. As she said this, Mother put her hand to her head. I don't feel well, children, she said. I'm going to lie down. She lay down on her bed, but she did not get better. She began to get much worse. Mrs. Viney, who helped in the cottage, sent for the doctor. You must rest, he said. You must have special foods and medicine. He wrote a list of these things and gave it to Roberta. You must be head nurse, he said. And Peter must go to the village and buy these things. The doctor left. Peter asked Mother for money to buy the special things that she needed. I have no money for such things, she said. I'll get better without them. The next day, Peter held up a notice as the green dragon came out of the tunnel towards the cottage. The notice said, Look out at the station. The old gentleman saw the notice. He looked out at the station as the train came in. He saw a little girl, it was Phyllis, running towards his carriage. He stood up and leaned out of the window of his carriage. Please read this, Phyllis said, and put a letter into his hand. The train left the station. The old gentleman sat down and read the letter. It was from Peter. The letter said, Dear Mr. We do not know your name. Mother is ill. And the doctor says we must give her some special things. But mother can't afford them. We do not know anyone here because father is away, and we do not know where he lives. Father will pay you, or if he has lost all his money, I will pay you when I am a man. I promise you, please get all the things on this list and give them to the station master tomorrow. The letter was signed by Peter, Roberta, and Phyllis. The old gentleman read the letter and smiled. Then he put it in his pocket and started to read his newspaper again. That night there was a knock on the door of the cottage. The porter from the railway station was there. An old gentleman gave this parcel to the station master, he said. It's for you. The parcel was full of everything on the list of special things to make mother well again. There was a letter from the old gentleman. It said, Dear Peter, Roberta, and Phyllis, here are the things on your list. I am very happy to give them to you, and I hope your mother is soon better. When she asks where the things come from, tell her they are from a friend. When she is well, you can tell her the truth. She may say that you are wrong to ask a stranger for these things. I think you are right. The letter was signed GP and something that the children could not read. I think we were right to ask the old gentleman for his help, Peter said. The important thing is for mother to feel better. Chapter 4 A Birthday Song Two weeks later, the children made another note. They held it up as the green dragon rushed past. The notice said, Mother is nearly well again. Thank you. The old gentleman saw the notice. He smiled and waved to the children. When they told Mother about the old gentleman, she was very angry with them. It was wrong to ask a stranger for help. She said. Then she stopped being angry and began to cry. The children thought this was worse. I'm sorry I was angry with you, she said. I know you don't really understand. We're poor, but we have enough money for food. You must never ever again ask anyone to give you things. 
Then mother wrote a letter to the old gentleman. Take this to the station master, she said. He will ask someone to give it to the old gentleman. The children went to the station. They gave the letter to the station master. Then they went to the porter's room to talk to him. The porter's name was Perks. He was friendly and told them about all the different kinds of engines. The next day was Roberta's birthday. Mother told her to go away and stay away until tea time. She felt very lonely in the garden, so she walked out of it and down the lane to the canal. There were barges on the canal, and people not only worked on the barges, they lived on them. The barges were their home, and the people were called bargees. Sadly, they were not very friendly to children. While Roberta was standing on the bridge, looking down at the barges as they passed beneath it, the doctor came up in his small horse and cart. Hello, head nurse, he said. Do you want to ride home? Roberta got into the cart and sat next to the doctor. As they rode along, she was very quiet. The doctor said, What's the matter, head nurse? Isn't your mother better? Oh, yes, she's getting better. Roberta said. But I think she's worried about your bill. I heard her talking in her sleep. She was saying, How can I pay the doctor? Again and again. The doctor did not say anything for several minutes. He was not a rich man, and he needed his patients to pay him. Roberta said, Are you angry with me? No, no, the doctor said. I'm not angry. I'll see what I can do about my bill. Roberta let the doctor go on to his house and stayed in the garden until tea time. When she went inside, there were twelve candles on the table, flowers, and some little parcels. As she walked into the room, Mother, Phyllis, and Peter sang a song to her. Mother wrote the words for a birthday song every year. Our darling Roberta. No sorrow shall hurt her, if we can prevent it her whole life long. Her birthday's our party day, we'll make it our great day, and give her our presents and sing her our song. At the end of the song, Mother said, Three cheers for Roberta! And she, Phyllis, and Peter shouted, Hip, hip, hooray! Roberta almost cried. She was so happy. Look at your presents, darling, Mother said. Roberta opened her presents. The one she liked best was from Peter. It was a model of the railway made out of different flowers. Then Peter put his real model engine on the table. You can have this, too, Peter said. Roberta knew he did not really want to give it to her, even though it was broken. She had an idea. Thank you, Peter, she said. You're very kind. She took the engine from him. The next day, she secretly left the house with the broken toy engine. She took it to the railway yard where an engine was filling up with water. There were two men on the footplate, the driver and the fireman. The fireman was the man who put the coal onto the fire that heated the water. Roberta was a little afraid. The engine was very big. She climbed onto the footplate to speak to the driver. He was busy and the engine was making a lot of noise. He did not see Roberta. He started the engine and it began to move off. Now Roberta could not get off. She touched the engine driver's arm. Excuse me? She said. He turned, and when he saw a small girl on the footplate, he was surprised and angry. What are you doing here? He shouted above the noise of the engine. I came to ask you to mend this, Roberta said, handing him the broken toy engine. I drive engines, he said. I don't mend them. But he looked at the engine and then said, It just needs a bit of solder. He stopped being angry with Roberta and explained how a real steam engine works. When they came to a station, he put some solder on the toy engine and mended it. Then he helped Roberta down from the footplate. Roberta got home just in time for tea.
Where have you been? Mother said. Oh, just to the station, Roberta said. I met someone who mended Peter's engine. She handed it to him. Here you are, Peter. I can't keep your engine. I know you love it. Peter took his engine back and hugged it. Everyone was happy. <music> Chapter 5 A Man Who Needs Help Mother had to go to the next town on business. The children decided to go to the station and wait for her train. They got there an hour early so that they could talk to their friends, the station master and the porter. They also talked to an engine driver and fireman whom they knew. Then they went into the waiting room and played games. It was not long before a train came in. It was not their mother's train, it came from the other direction. The children did not go out to look at the people who got on or off the train. They were busy with their game. Then they heard the noise of many people talking. They went out of the waiting room to see what was happening. There was a crowd of people at the far end of the platform. Let's go and see what everyone is looking at, Roberta said. They ran to the end of the platform. At first, they could not see anything except the backs of people. Then the station master walked up, and the crowd let him pass. The children could now see what the crowd was looking at. It was a man. He was not an ordinary man. He looked wild and ill, and his clothes were torn and dirty. He was lying on the ground. He was on the train, a woman told the station master. He got off as the train was coming into the station and fell down. I don't think he has a ticket. Show me your ticket, the station master said to the man. The man just looked at him. I think he is foreign, another passenger said. He doesn't understand English. Perhaps he's French, Peter said. I know some French words. He spoke a few words in French, but the man did not understand him. Your French accent is very bad, Roberta said. He probably doesn't understand your French. Perhaps he's German, another passenger said. Or Italian. Or Norwegian. Many of the passengers made suggestions, but no one could speak any of these languages. Peter had an idea. He had in his pocket a small packet of foreign stamps. He showed the wild looking man the stamps from many different countries. The man shook his head at each of them until Peter showed him a Russian stamp. Then he touched the stamp and nodded his head. He's Russian, Peter said. Many Russians can speak French. Mother can speak French. She'll talk to him when she arrives. Mother's train soon arrived. She got off the train and looked down the platform. Phyllis waved to her and she walked up to the children. This man is Russian, Mummy, Peter said. Perhaps he speaks French. Mother spoke to the man in French. He answered her in French. They had a short conversation. Mother turned to the station master. This man is ill and he has no money. I will take him home with me. We cannot leave him here. Perhaps he is a dangerous criminal, the station master said. I should call the police. He traveled on the train without a ticket. Please don't, Mother said. I am sure he is a good man. Very well, the station master said. But I think you are foolish. He walked away. Help this gentleman to walk, Mother said. He is very weak. Roberta and Peter stood on either side of the man. He leaned on them and very slowly walked from the station to the cottage. When they got there, Mother made up a bed for him. Then she said, Go for the doctor, Roberta. Roberta went to fetch the doctor. We can't pay you. She said. But the man is very ill. 
Please come. The doctor thought for a few moments. Then he said, I suppose I must go. But one day perhaps your mother will be able to pay me. He went with Roberta to the cottage and examined the man. Then he said, He is very weak and has a bad cough. He is also very thin and needs rest and good food. Mother thanked the doctor and he left. She went up to the attic and opened a large trunk. It was full of men's clothes. Mother began to take some clothes out of the trunk. Are they father's clothes? Roberta asked. Yes, darling. Mother said. Why are they here? Phyllis demanded. Is father dead? No, he is not dead. Mother said. One day he will come back to us. She gave some clothes to the wild man, and he went out to the garden and began to wash under the pump. Mother said to the children, He is a refugee. He spoke out against the government in Russia, and he was sent to prison. He was a prisoner for a long time. While he was in prison, his wife and children came to live in England. Friends helped him to escape from prison, and he has come to England to find his wife and children. They escaped a year ago. He does not know where they are, and he has no money. You seem to be very sorry for him, Mother, Roberta said. I am. I am sad for all people in prison. When you say your prayers tonight, say a prayer for everyone who is in prison. Chapter 6 A Landslide As each day passed, the Russian got better. Mother wrote to people who might be able to help him find his family. The children wanted to be kind to the man. They brought him flowers. One day, Roberta said, Perks, the porter has a garden. He promised us some strawberries from it. Let's ask him if he will give us some for the refugee. At first, Perks was not friendly. He did not know anything about the Russian. He was unhappy because the station master kept the information secret from him. When the children told him everything they knew, he became friendly again. He gave some strawberries to the Russian, who was very pleased to have them. The children wanted another surprise for him. They remembered that there were some wild cherry trees near the railway tunnel. Mother let them take a picnic lunch there. She lent them a watch so that they would not come home late. When they arrived at the tunnel, they looked up at the trees above it. What's happening? Peter said. Look at the trees. They're moving. He was right. The trees were sliding down the hill. It's a landslide, Roberta said. There has been a lot of rain. The earth is soft. It is moving and bringing the trees with it. They are going to fall on the railway line, Phyllis said. There'll be an accident if the train hits them. We must stop the next train. How do we do that? Peter said. The next train is due at 11.29. That's in five minutes. And the train is only about 15 kilometers away. We can run towards the train and wave to the driver. Phyllis said. He won't think there is anything wrong. Roberta said. We always wave to him. We need something red to wave, Peter said. Red is for danger. My petticoat is red, Phyllis said. I'll tear pieces off. Mother will be angry if you do that, Roberta said. Petticoats are expensive. People may die if there is an accident, Peter said. Petticoats are important. Phyllis tore strips from the bottom of her petticoat. We need sticks to tie the strips to, Peter said. The children ran to a nearby tree. With his knife, Peter cut off three thin branches. He tied each of the strips of red petticoat to one of the branches. Now we have red flags, he said. When we wave these, the engine driver will know something is wrong, 
He will stop the train and ask us what the matter is. The children ran through the tunnel and waited at the other side for the train to come. They had to wait a long time. Peter thought the watch must be wrong, but it was the train that was late. Then the train arrived. The children waved their flags. Roberta was so excited that she fainted. The engine driver saw the red flags and the children. He knew something was wrong. He stopped the train. Peter and Phyllis ran towards the engine. They shouted to the driver that there were trees on the line. The engine driver climbed down from his engine. He hurried to where Roberta was lying on the ground in a faint. He picked her up and carried her to the train and put her in a comfortable carriage. Stay with her, the engine driver said. I'm going to take the train back to the last station. The station master there will send some men to move the trees off the line. The passengers on the train were leaning out of the carriages. They wanted to know why the train was not moving. When the engine driver told them, they cheered for the children. You have prevented a bad accident, the engine driver said. I'm sure the railway company. Chapter 7 The Letter A few days after the children prevented a bad railway accident, they received a letter from the railway company. It said, Dear Sir and Ladies, The company wishes to make a small presentation to you to thank you for your action. You prevented a serious accident in which people would have been killed or injured. We wish to make the presentation at the railway station on Saturday at three o'clock. Please let us know if this is a good day and time for you. Yours faithfully, Jabez Inglewood, Secretary, Great Northern and Southern Railway Company. Roberta gave the letter to Mother to read and said, Can we go to the presentation? Of course you can, but don't accept any money from the railway company. What kind of presentation will it be? Phyllis asked. Perhaps it will be a medal, Peter said. The kind of medal soldiers get for bravery. I want you to look your best at the presentation, Mother said. You must all help me wash and iron your best clothes. The children did this. Then they wrote a letter to the railway company and signed it. Their letter said, Dear Mr. Jabez Inglewood, Thank you very much for your letter. We do not want any kind of reward. We were happy to prevent an accident. We are glad you want to make a presentation, and the day and time is all right for us. Thank you very much. Your friends, Roberta, Phyllis, and Peter. When the day of the presentation arrived, the children went to the station in their best clothes at the right time. To their surprise, the station looked very different. There was a red carpet on the platform and flowers everywhere. There were chairs for people to sit on. There were also a lot of people. They were not only their friends who worked for the railway. They were the passengers from the train. Their old gentleman friend was there, and they shook hands with him. First, the secretary of the railway company made a speech. Then the old gentleman gave each of the children a beautiful watch. Finally, Peter thanked everyone and said that he and his sister did not deserve such a nice reward. Everyone clapped after the wonderful presentation. Later on, the children found out that it was Perks's birthday. They planned a birthday party with Mrs. Perks. At first, Perks was not happy about receiving free food, but later understood that everyone liked him very much. After the children returned home, Roberta asked, Do you think the old gentleman can help the Russian find his family? The Russian was still living with him, and he could now speak a few words of English. However, none of Mother's friends were able to help him find his family. Let's write to the old gentleman, Phyllis said. This is what the children wrote. Dearest old gentleman, we need to tell you something. Will you please get out of the train for a few minutes tomorrow? We don't want you to give us anything. We just want to talk to you about a prisoner.
your friends, Roberta, Phyllis, and Peter. The children took the letter to the station master and asked him to give it to the old gentleman. The next day they went to the station. When the train came, the old gentleman got off. The children ran up to him. Thank you for coming to talk to us, Roberta said. I'm happy too, the old gentleman said. Let's go into the waiting room. They all went into the waiting room. The children told the old gentleman about the Russian. He wrote a book, Peter said, and it made the government so angry that they put him in prison. What's his name? The old gentleman asked. I can't pronounce it, Peter said. But I can spell it. He wrote down the Russian's name on a piece of paper. It was Mr. Skizbansky. I know that name, the old gentleman said. I've read his book. I know many Russians in London, and they will know this man. But now, tell me all about yourselves. You're such good children, and your mother is so kind to help a poor refugee. I want to know everything about you. The children began to talk about themselves, their mother, and their father. Phyllis left the waiting room for a short time and then came back carrying a pot of tea and some bread and butter. Perks, the porter gave this to me. She said. The children had a delightful tea party with the old man. Then he got on the next train and went on his way to London. Ten days later, the children were sitting above the station when the 5:15 train came in. They saw the old gentleman get off. Then the train left the station. He's come to talk to us, Peter said. The children ran down to the station. The old gentleman was waiting for them. I have good news for you, he said. I have found the Russian's wife and child. May I come with you to your cottage and tell him the good news? The children led the old gentleman to their cottage. He told the Russian the good news. Pack your things and come to London with me, he added. Then he turned to mother. You have done a wonderful thing by helping this man. He is an important writer. Mother was happy for the Russian. He was looking forward to seeing his wife and child again. She also felt sad, though. She thought about her own husband. Chapter Eight. What happened to father? One day, the children went down to the canal and looked at the slow-moving water. Peter threw a line into the water. He soon caught a fish. The children were so busy looking at the fish that they didn't hear a horse coming towards them. A voice shouted, "Get out of the way!" They looked around and saw a horse walking along the towpath, pulling a barge. The bargee was shouting at them so that the horse could pass on the narrow path. Then he saw the fish at the end of Peter's line. "You mustn't fish here," he said. "No one can fish here." He jumped off the barge and took hold of Peter's ear. He was a big man with a red face. Roberta took hold of the bargee's arm. "Don't hurt my brother," she said. "He wasn't doing any harm." The bargee let go of Peter's ear. "You just keep away from here," the bargee said. Then he walked away. A woman came out of the cabin at the end of the barge. "Don't pay any attention to him," she said. "He's just miserable, but he doesn't mean you any harm. He doesn't want you to play near the canal. You might fall in and drown." The woman walked off the bargee and onto the towpath. My baby's inside and asleep, she said. I'm going to the inn to have a drink with my husband. She walked away. Shall we go home? Roberta said. I'm going to catch another fish, Peter said. The canal is public property. Anyone can fish in it.
he walked along the canal to another place, and Phyllis and Roberta followed him. They sat by the canal for about an hour while Peter tried to catch a fish. Then Roberta looked back to the barge. Smoke was coming out of the cabin at the end of the barge. It's on fire, she cried. There's a baby in there, Phyllis shouted. The three children ran back to the barge. Peter tied a wet handkerchief around his mouth and nose and ran into the cabin. It was full of thick smoke. There are no flames, he shouted. Only smoke. I can't see very well. He felt his way to where the baby was lying and picked it up. As he did so, a dog ran at him and barked. It tried to bite his leg. Peter ran out of the cabin with the baby in his arms. The dog was barking at him. Peter gave the baby to Phyllis. I'll run to the inn, Roberta said. And tell the bargee and his wife that their baby is safe, but that the cabin is on fire. When Roberta went into the inn, she saw the bargee and his wife sitting in a corner. Your cabin's on fire, she shouted at them. But your baby is safe. My sister is holding her. Later, when the bargee and his wife were putting out the fire, Peter said, "How did the fire start?" I left my pipe on the shelf. The bargee said, "I didn't know that it was still lit. Some hot ash fell on the floor and set the carpet on fire." The bargee and his wife were very grateful to the children. "Wave to us whenever you see us," the bargee said. His name was Bill. You can come on the barge and have a ride. When the children got home, they told mother about their adventure. We've made new friends, Peter said. Now we've not only got friends on the railway, but we've also got friends on the canal. I'm happy for you, mother said, but she looked sad as she went to the room where she did her writing. Roberta went to speak to her. What's wrong, mummy? She asked. Mother said, "You never ask me about your father. Have you forgotten about him?" No, Roberta exclaimed. "We often talk about him amongst ourselves. We don't say anything to you because we don't want to upset you." You must never forget your father, Mother said. "He is a good man. One day he will come back to us." But where is he? Why can't he come back to us now? Roberta demanded. One day I'll explain. Mother said. When you are old enough to understand. Roberta left mother to get on with her writing. About a week later, Roberta was in the attic looking for a book when she found an old newspaper. She picked it up and looked through it. To her surprise. There was a news item about her father. She read it quickly. Then she read it again and again, very slowly. Tears ran down from her eyes. She went into the kitchen where mother was cooking. I must talk to you, she said. Phyllis and Peter were in the kitchen. They saw the tears in her eyes. She's done something wrong. Peter whispered to Phyllis. She's probably broken something. Phyllis whispered back. Mother saw that Roberta was very upset. Let's go to my writing room. She said. When Roberta and mother were in the writing room, Roberta gave her the newspaper. I found this in the attic. I don't understand. Mother did not need to read the news item. She knew what it said. Sit down, darling," she said. "I'll tell you all about it." Roberta sat on the floor near her mother. "Your father worked for the government. He had a senior position. One day, the minister in charge of his department received a phone call. A man said that father was a spy, and that there were letters in his desk from a foreign government." The man said that father was selling government secrets to the foreign government. The minister told the police. The police looked in father's desk. They found the letters. 
Roberta was horrified. I can't believe Daddy was a spy. He wasn't, but he couldn't prove that he wasn't. The letters had his name on them. How did they get there? Roberta asked. Daddy and I think that another man in the department put them there. He had a lower position than Daddy and wanted his job. This was his way of getting it. But that's terrible, Roberta said. I know, darling, and one day we shall prove Daddy's innocence. Until then, he must stay in prison for many years. That's why you are writing all the time. Yes, darling. I have to earn money for our food and so on. The only thing I know how to do is tell stories. Now promise me that you won't tell Peter and Phyllis. I will tell them when the time is right. Roberta kept her promise, but she wrote to the old gentleman. She asked for his help. She put the piece of newspaper with the news item into the envelope with her letter. Then she took it to the station and asked the station master to give it to the old gentleman. Chapter Nine: The Return Home. Very soon after Roberta wrote to the old gentleman, the three children were walking through the tunnel when they heard a cry. There's someone in here, Peter said. Who can it be? Perhaps we ought to go back, Phyllis said. She was always afraid of strangers. We can't do that, Roberta said. People cry out for a reason. Hello, Peter shouted. Who's there? Help me! A voice shouted back. I can't move. That's not a man's voice, Roberta said. That's a boy's voice. The children ran deeper into the tunnel. Before long, they came to a boy. He was lying on the ground. What happened? Roberta asked him. I was walking through the tunnel when I tripped. I think I've broken my leg. The eleven fifteen train is due soon, Peter said. We must get you out of here. I've been here for two hours, the boy said. I was on my way to the station to catch the train. It's quicker through the tunnel than along the road. It's also more dangerous, Roberta said. Oh, stop talking, Peter said. We've got to get him out. What's your name, Jim? Come on then, Jim. Hold on to me," Roberta said. "Peter and Phyllis will help you up. Then you must try to hop on one leg as fast as you can." It was a difficult journey back to the beginning of the tunnel, but the children got there before the eleven fifteen train did. Peter found a small house. Inside was a sleeping signalman. Peter shouted to wake him up. They took Jim home. Mother called for a doctor and helped Jim rest. We must tell your parents," she said to Jim. "I live with my grandfather," the boy said, and he gave mother his grandfather's name and address. When the doctor came, he looked at Jim's leg. "It's a bad break," he said. "You'll need to stay in bed for at least a month." "Can he stay with us?" Peter said. "We'd love to have a friend our own age." "I don't know," mother said. We must find out what his grandfather wants. She gave the letter to the doctor, who promised to post it. A few days later, there was a knock on the door. Who can that be? Mother said. She went to open the door. An old gentleman was standing there. I'm Jim's grandfather, he said. I've come to take Jim home. You've been very kind. The old gentleman followed mother into the sitting room. This is Jim's grandfather, mother said to the children. They were all sitting with their mouths open, looking at the old gentleman. You're our old gentleman! They exclaimed. That's right, he said. And I got your letter, Roberta. What letter? Mother demanded. Roberta wrote to me about her father. 
the old gentleman said. I was not surprised by what she said. I have thought for a long time that he was innocent. It was not possible that a guilty man could have such wonderful children. She shouldn't have written to you, Mother said. She did the right thing, the old gentleman said. I know some very important people in the government. They are going to ask the court to look at the evidence again. I don't want you to get too excited, but I think your father will soon be free again. This was wonderful news, and the children ran up to mother and put their arms round her. Then Roberta said, "Jim has to stay in bed for a month. Let him stay here. Mother can nurse him." Mother laughed. <laughs> "I'd like to do that," mother said. If father is coming home, I won't need to write so much. And so Jim stayed with the children and became their very best friend. Two weeks later, there was another knock on the door. This time, Roberta opened it. Daddy! She cried. Then she turned and shouted, "Daddy's home!" Mother Phyllis and Peter came running. The family was all. Playlet. The railway children. Mother, when is Daddy coming home? I don't know, dear. Where is he? He's had to go away. We know that, but where? He's on government business. Is it a secret? Yes, it is. Do you mean he couldn't even tell you, his wife? It's difficult to explain, dear. I don't understand. Why couldn't he tell you where he is? Don't ask me any more questions. Well, do you ever speak to him? Is he well? I speak to him, and he's well. Now go to the sitting room and read your books. I think Mother knows where Daddy is. She just won't tell us. She's not being fair. Why can't we know? If he's doing something secret for the government, she might be afraid we'd tell someone. I can keep a secret. Yeah, for five minutes, Phyllis. I think you're right, Peter. I think Daddy's doing secret work for the government. He's probably abroad. Do you think he's a spy? He might be. How exciting! I expect he wears a disguise, like a beard. I hope he's not in any danger. Spies are shot if they are caught. He's been away for a long time. Don't spies have holidays? Don't be silly. I'm going to the attic to get another book. Don't tell me you don't know about this. I just hoped you'd never find out. So Daddy is a spy, but not for our country. He's a spy for a foreign country. For a foreign country. No, darling, it's all a terrible mistake. He's innocent. It says in this news item that there were letters in his desk, letters from a foreign government. They thanked him for the information and gave him money. It's all lies, darling. Daddy never gave a foreign government any information, and he never received any money from a foreign government. But the letters, they are fake. They were put into his desk by someone. Why? Why did someone want Daddy to go to prison? I don't know, dear. You must have some idea. I think there is a man in the same office where Daddy worked who was jealous of him. He wanted Daddy's job. He planned to have him arrested. That's terrible. I know, dear. Unfortunately, however, we can't prove it. We can't just let Daddy stay in prison if he's innocent. He is, darling. He is. He'd never do anything like that. Then there must be a way to prove it. Thank you so much for stopping to talk to me. I read the news item you sent me with your letter. I know about your father's case. I have thought for a long time that he is innocent. I know he is. 
Daddy is a good man. He'd never do anything to hurt our country. I have some friends in the government. I'll talk to them and ask them if the police would reopen the case. They might find some evidence that can help your father. We don't have any money to pay lawyers. We can't even afford to pay the doctor's bills. I know it is very difficult for you and your mother. How is she? She's getting better, but she's worried all the time. She misses Daddy. We all do. And there's never enough money. She writes all day and every day. She sells some of her stories, but not all of them. I don't think being a writer is easy. I'm sure it isn't. Can you really help get Daddy out of prison? I can't promise anything, Roberta, but I will do my best. Don't get your hopes up too much, and don't say anything to your mother. We mustn't raise her hopes. Okay, it'll be our secret. Yes, our secret. And now I must go. My train is about to leave. Where have you been, Roberta? Oh, just for a walk. Where did you go? Just to the station. Did you talk to anybody? Just to the porter, Mr. Perks. I don't believe you, Roberta. I can always tell when you're lying. Your face turns red. I'm not lying, Mother. Yes, you are. Were you talking to that nice old gentleman? He was on the train. What did you say to him? Nothing much. I'm going to my room to read. No, you're not. You're going to tell me what you and the old gentleman talked about. I've told you. Nothing much. Just the usual. Were you talking to him about Daddy? Well? Oh, if you must know, I asked him to help us. Help us? How can he help us? Your father is in prison for something he didn't do. I know, and the old gentleman thinks he's innocent, too. He's going to talk to some people he knows in the government. We haven't got any money for lawyers. He knows that. I ought to be angry with you for talking about our private problems. I just want to help Daddy. I know, darling, I know. We all do. Perhaps the old gentleman will be able to help. Who knows?